Yeah, Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Bakari Aisha Rodua, a student of the Faculty of Pharmaceutical Sciences, University of Learning. We are on our clinical rotation at the Drug Information Unit, University of Learning Teaching Hospital. And I'd like to talk about the topic, medication and misadventures, medication and patient safety. There are three terminologies that are attached to this topic. We have the medication error, adverse drug event, and adverse drug reaction. These three terms are often confused. They are interrelated and they are often confused, but they have very distinct definitions, and I'd like to talk about it. I'll first define medication. Um, first, let me define adverse drug event. Adverse drug event is any injury from a medicine or medication or lack of intended medicine, and it refers to all the adverse drug reactions, including allergic or idiosyncratic reactions. Now, I'd like to define adverse drug reaction. Adverse drug reaction is any reaction that is unintended, noxious, and undesired that causes adrodosis, normally used for patients for therapeutic, diagnostic, prophylaxis, or and for normal physiological functions. So now I'd like to talk about um, the impact of errors on patients and healthcare system. Let's talk about most patients that come to healthcare professionals, they come for, for us to make them stay healthy. And the initiation of drug therapy is the most common medical treatment, treatment received by patients. And what adverse drug reaction, adverse drug events, and medication errors leads to is basically drug related morbidity and mortality. And um, the Harvard Medical um, Practice Study, they did, um, they did a research that showed that 3.7% of hospitalized patients experience adverse events. This is very serious. Also, there was a study that there was an Harvard Medical Practice Study too, another research that was carried out that showed that 44,000 to over 90,000 patients are killed by medication error every year. This is staggering, really. Also, economic, economically, adverse drug events and medication errors add unnecessary acts to burden on healthcare system. There was a study that showed in 1995 that showed that over 76 billion dollars were spent annually on ambulatory care medication error. Now I'll talk about identification and reporting of medication errors and this advanced drug event. We have four distinct types. We have the voluntary system. This is when anybody can be performed by anybody, by the pharmacist, by the medical doctors, by the patients, where you go, when you notice something, you go to the proper unit, which is the pharmacovigilance unit, you go there to report. It can be anonymous. You don't need to really put in your name. We have another system, which is another method, which is direct observation method. In this method, it, is the, it involves the real-time delivery of the medication. You compare what is actually given to the patient by the physician's orders. Another method is the chart review identification of med medication error. This is very um, labor-intensive and costly, where you review there are trained staff that review the charts and you check for medication errors. Then if you find any, you, have, you report to the appropriate authority. We have another method which is in developing countries using the ADE trigger tool. It is a trigger tool which is promoted by the Institute of Healthcare Improvement. It is an automated system that checks. It basically does checks and balances. It checks for errors in medications. Now I'd like to talk about classification of error types. Why do we classify errors? It's based, it helps us to just know the cause of events. It is very self-explanatory. Mm -hmm. Some of these are events by prescription error, omission error, wrong drug, and so on and so forth. I like to talk about managing and reporting adverse events. We have various, so you assign responsibility, you develop online forms and you provide awareness. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. My name is Oyebilwa Danwala. I'll be talking on introduction to the concept of drug information. Drug information is defined by its role in providing information about drug therapy and drugs in response to requests from various health care providers, patients, organizations, committees, and public community, either by WHO or written form. Drug information could be described as information found in a reference or verbalized by an individual that pertains to medications. Drug informatics refers to the electronic management of drug information. 
It emphasized the use of technology as an integral to in effectively organizing, analyzing, managing, and communicating information on medication use in patients. The beginning of the concepts of drug information. The term drug information was developed in the early 1960s when using conjunction with the words center and specialist. In 1962, the first drug information center was opened at the University of Kentucky Medical Center. This center desired to be a source of comprehensive drug information for staff physicians, dentists, and nurses. Another goal was to take an active role in the education of health professional students, including medicine, dentistry, and nursing, and specifically influence pharmacy students in developing their role as drug consultants. Several other drug information centers was established shortly thereafter. The first formal survey conducted in 1983 identified 54 pharmacist operated centers in the United States states. Medication information services during the formation of the drug information units. The services they provide include supporting clinical services with medication information, answering questions regarding medication, coordinating pharmacy and therapeutics committee activity, developing medication use policies, publishing or editing information on appropriate medication use through newsletters, journals, websites, email, and social media, coordinating formulary management initiatives, developing guide, uh, guidelines for medication use, analyzing the clinical and economic impact of drug policy de uh, decisions, providing education for health professionals, students, and consumers, the evolution. Over time, the activity of the pharmacist as a medication expert for patients has gained acceptance in a variety of practice settings, including community pharmacies, nursing homes, and primary and specialty clinics. Pharmacists will provide patient-specific information with a goal of improving patient outcomes, use the medical literature to support their choices. The medication information skills a pharmacist should possess was identified during the evolution process. And they include one, they should be able to assess available information and gather situational data needed to characterize questions or issue. Two, formulate appropriate questions. Three, use a systematic approach to find needed information. Four, evaluate information critically for validity. Five, develop, organize, and summarize response for questions or issue. Six, communicate clearly when speaking or writing at an appropriate level of understanding. Seven, anticipate other information needs. Factors influencing evolution of pharmacy's rule as a medication information provider include one, adverse drug events, Two, integration of new health information technologies. The adverse drug event is one of the primary roles for drug information specialties in the beginning. Uh, in the beginning, it was, it was very hard for them. One of, okay. one of the primary roles for drug information special, uh, specialists in the beginning was collecting and evaluating adverse drug reactions. This role will continue to expand because it is anticipated that the number of adverse drug events will increase in the near future for several reasons, which are the availability of new medications and new indications with conventional medications, the growing elderly population, the increased use of medication for disease pre uh, prevention, and the improved insurance coverage for medications. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Raja Aisha, and I'll be talking on the ethical aspects of drug information practice. Uh, the Ethics Cost Content Committee of the American Association of Colleges of Pharmacy, AACP, described ethics as the philosophical inquiry of the moral dimensions of human conduct. They mentioned that Aristotle 
taught ethics as an eminently practical dis discipline, dealing with concrete judgments in situations in which action must be taken despite uncertainty. Vitach in his work stated that an ethical or moral issue involves judgments between right and wrong human conduct or praiseworthy and blameworthy human character. Now, ethical, ethical deliberation may be differentiated from other endeavors by three characteristics. One, it is ultimate or fundamental. That is, there is no higher standard against which to measure the rightness of the decision or action. Two, the issue is universal. The parties involved in the dilemma do not consider it simply a difference of opinion or taste. Rather, each party believes that there is a right or wrong answer even if they disagree about what the answer is. And lastly, the deliberation takes into account the welfare of all involved or affected by the judgment at hand. Those who provide drug information, those who provide drug information, they typically rely on an intuitive sense of these characteristics they have the feeling that the situation being confronted is a big deal. And somehow they anticipate that they should not address only personal preference in the matter at hand. Now, different levels of ethics. Evolving literature has described that ethical judgments may occur at the mi micro, meso, or macro level of healthcare decision making. The micro level of healthcare is related to decisions made, made at the individual professional patient level of healthcare. A less commonly discussed meso level of decision-making is variably described as occurring at the institutional or organizational level or at community or regional levels, while the macro level decision-making often sets policy for the health system as a standard established for an entire profession or through government as law or regulation for the society as a whole. Now, the difference between ethics and law. Professional ethics is different than the law. Law might be defined as rules of conduct imposed by the society on its members. By contrast, professional ethics has been defined as rules of conduct or standards by which a particular group in society regulates its actions and set standards for its members. Both constitute macro level policy making across society or across an entire profession. Now, Beecham and Childress, they stated in their work that when we deliberate, we are considering which judgment is morally justified. They also indicated that particular judgments are justified by moral rules which in turn are justified by principles, which ultimately are defended by an ethical theory. Now we talk about the theories, the ethical theories. The prominent rules and principles guiding ethical decision-making by healthcare professionals can generally be placed within one of two broad ethical theories. The first one is the consequentialist theory. And the second is the deontological theory which is derived from the Greek word dion, meaning duty. Now, the consequentialist theories describe actions or decisions as morally right or wrong based on their consequences, rather than on any intrinsic features they may have. There are two cardinal principles of the, conse of the consequentialist theory. They had the beneficence. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Gazal Abdullah. I'll be speaking on Drug and Therapeutics Committee. The Drug and Therapeutics Committee is an essential component of an healthcare organization's medicine use, selection, and distribution. They are said to have an array of functions which center around rational drug use. Now, any patient who comes into a healthcare facility can be said to be administered with a drug. It might be, even if it is for surgical procedures, 
the patient tends to use a particular drug pre or post surgical procedure. So now why, what we've, we've defined what a drug and therapeutics committee is. Why do we need a drug and therapeutics committee? Globally across developed or developing countries, healthcare budgets are assumed to take a large percentage of a country's national budget. And in this healthcare budget, about 40% are spent on purchase of pharmaceuticals. Then in this 40% of pharmaceuticals, an average of more than 50% of the 40% budgeted for pharmaceuticals are usually wasted or spent on wrong drug purchase or ineffective purchase of medications. At the center of ineffective and wrong drug purchase, we find that antibiotics take a large percentage, or let's say anti-infective drugs, which may also include antifungal agents, antiviral agents, and anti -helminthics. Now, antibiotics or anti-infectives are at the core because most, most undeveloped or underdeveloped countries tend to use empirical formula or not use appropriate or do not even use at all microbiological culture sensitivity testing. So this can also lead to antimicrobial resistance. So now what can an healthcare facility gain by having a drug and therapeutics committee? The drug and therapeutics committee can provide the leadership and structure that is requisite for appropriate and effective use selection, distribution, and purchase of pharmaceuticals. What are the benefits of the drug and therapeutics committee? One, we say selection of effective, safe, affordable, and quality pharmaceuticals. Secondly, they help in identifying drug use problems and thus help improve quality of patient care and health outcomes. Three, since antibiotics, or let's say anti-infectives, are at the center of wrong or inappropriate drug purchase, drug and therapeutics committee help in management of antimicrobial resistance. They also help improve, they also help in decreasing adverse drug reactions and medication errors. And then they also increase staff and patient knowledge. Now talking about the rule, talking about the rules and functions of a drug therapeutics committee, Firstly, they advise medical staff, administrative and pharmaceutical staffs. They do this by giving recommendations and advices on the selection, purchase, use, distribution, and administration of drugs. Secondly, they develop drug policies and procedures. The policies may include addition of new medicines, review of current medicines in the formulary. They give instructions on prescription and dispensing of restricted medicines. They give instructions on how to use non-formulary medicines. Non-formulary medicines would include drugs that are not currently in the healthcare facilities formulary. Then they give standard treatment guidelines to improve medicines use. Thank you. Good day, everybody. My name is Adebayo Taye David. Okay, I'll be talking on medication misadventures. So I'll be focusing on adverse drug reaction. So uh, first and foremost, I would like to intimate us with the definition of medication misadventure. <clears throat> What's medication misadventure? According to the American Society of Health System Pharmacists, that's the ESHP, they defined um, medication misadventure as an iatrogenic acid. So, and um, they ascribe it to five incidents. So um, the first one is, is an inherent risk when medication therapy is indicated. Second one is, it is created through either omission or commission by the administration of a medicine or medicines 
during which a patient may be armed with effects ranging from mild discomfort to fatality. The third one, um, a medication misadventure is that whose outcome may or may not be independent of the pre-existing pathology or disease process. So they also said it is attrib attributable to error of either human source or system or boots, immunologic response to or idiosyncratic response. And finally, is always unexpected, undesirable to the patients and the health professional. So medication <laughs> misadventure constitutes any preventive events that may cause or lead to inappropriate medication use or patient arm. Why the medication is in the control of the healthcare professional. So medication misadventure generally are preventable. Now I would like to focus on adverse drug reaction. <laughs> According to the World Health Organization, an adverse drug reaction is any response that is noxious, unintended, or undesired, which occurs at doses normally used in humans for prophylaxis, diagnosis, therapy of disease, or modification of physiological function. So um, in essence, it's stating that at the right dose or at the dose which is meant for the therapeutic response, adverse drug reaction occurs at that same dose. So they can be referred to as medication-related adverse events. So adverse drug reaction could be as a result of a preventable medication, medication error, resulting in the side effects as a result of medication administration or an unforeseen error, such as an allergic reaction. So, um, so basically, adverse drug reactions, they are categorized into three. First is dose slash drug related. The second one is allergic. The third one is idiosyncratic reaction. So talking on dose related and drug related, <clears throat> they are usually related to the dose of the medication and are usually predictable but sometimes unavoidable. So I guess you understand. It is highly dependent <clears throat> on the patient's sensitivity to the drug and combinations of medication used. It generally does not lead to severe adverse drug reaction, but it's relatively common. So the second one, an allergic adverse drug reaction <clears throat> is when the patient develops an inappropriate reaction to the medication, which mostly could be avoided with a skin test prior to or through effective consultation and communication between primary care facilities and patients. So um, finally, the idiosyncratic adverse drug reaction is a type that is not widely understood and its severity is often quite unpredictable. This affects the fewer people and the reason for the adverse may be genetically predetermined. So um, finally, um, adverse drug reaction have become a significant problem in patients who are on multiple medications, such as the elderly. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Bade Jamonto and I'll be presenting on formulating an effective response, a structured approach. This involves um, the proper collection of information from, from patients regarding their medical condition and also the drugs that are uh, going to be taken so as to properly um, advise them on how to take the drugs to prevent side effects or lessen side effects and also to report to medical authorities whenever they see any side effects also. So in order to properly carry this out, there are some factors that should be considered. And these factors include patient factor, which in, um, includes the demographic, the allergies and intolerance, the chief complaints, the history of present illness, family history and genetic makeup, laboratory tests and physical examinations. And we also have medical factors which include pharmacogenetics, allergy, adverse effects, cross allergenicity, contraindication and precautions. So formulating a good response should also, in, uh, should also 
um, it also encompasses having good communication skills. And um, a pharmacist should always pay attention to properly collecting information as well as interpreting them before giving a response to patients. So, Also, um, the effective response also involves it is important to do this kind of things so as to enable patients follow their medications properly. It will help to um, accentuate or make make um, make them make us achieve as a a member of the medical team to make us achieve the proper plan uh, so as to minimize side effects, make patients recover on time, and also to, to um, give better prognosis. Thank you. I am Tabe Nelson. And I will be talking on drug information and ambulatory care. Now, when it comes to drug information and ambulatory care, patients out there may say, uh, I can Google information about these drugs myself and get them myself and uh, you know, get going. But one thing I want you to know about health professionals uh, like pharmacists and medical doctors is these people have access to professional literature and uh, databases uh, which uh, analyze critically this information that the public assesses and they also interpret this information taking into co 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 consideration the particular patient's health condition and uh, alongside the current uh, guidelines for treatment. Now, let's take, for example, three patients uh, with hypertension. Now, the first patient has hypertension and a CKD, that's uh, chronic kidney disease. The second patient with diabetes and the third patient with sepsis. You shouldn't say because patient one or two is taking molecule YZ for the hypertension. So you two, being patient three, should take the same molecules. Now, Drugs are given based uh, or considering the other disease conditions that these patients have. And now pharmacists have the responsibility of, um, you know, educating the public and other health workers uh, about uh, drugs. And an example of this type of education uh, include ensuring that biased sources such as pharmaceutical representatives are not the main source of new product education for pre prescribers. Now, uh, researching and answering drug information questions, these questions may be and may not be patient specific. And in most cases, they used to be patient specific. Now, uh, debunking misperception that may arise from direct to consumer advertising and also providing basic statistical training, including terms like relative risk versus actual risk of treatment. Now, pharmacists in uh, ambulatory care, and I should say pharmacists generally, have the drug information responsibilities, including this few, but not limited to this. Now, ensuring patients understand the appropriate use of their medications. The truth is some patients, when asked to take their medications, they feel they are doing you a favor. And most of them do not know what to expect when they take their medications. But when you educate them, when you have a good relationship, a good rapport with them, they get to understand why these medications should be taken. And they get to understand their regimen and keep to it. Now, the next point is delivering preventive health information. This is also very important. There are a lot of cases here in the hospital that shouldn't have been here if these people understood the preventive methods. 
it is not as if we don't do, but how effective do we do this? And how effective do these uh, uh, things, you know, does this message, you know, get across to the people we are, uh, the, 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 the people we target? It is very important to give them this preventive information to help some of them stay healthy and not end up in the hospital. Now, ensuring prescribed uh, medication is appropriate and follows current treatment guidelines for given conditions. And also assisting pre prescribers to find most cost-effective and safe medication for the patients. This is also very important. Then incorporating quality assurance indicators into daily practice. This is very important too. How do we know the effectiveness of what we do, the effectiveness of our services? especially on daily basis, if we don't incorporate these quality assurance indicators. So this put together is what we have to offer today uh, in our drug information uh, um, uh, rotation. Thank you. <laughs>